Okay, good evening everyone. I just have one request. If you can switch off your phones, that would be very helpful. I have to leave mine on because well, otherwise it won't work. You're the main person today. So. <laughs> Um, my name is Alicia Briska and I am a member of the board of directors here in Pia at Piazza. Um, our boss is in Poland, so I'm just taking her place. Um, now, Piazza, uh, before I give the mic to um, Norman, I just would like to tell you a couple of sentences about, you know, what Piazza is and, uh, you know, what we are trying to do here. Uh, we were founded in 1942 as an independent and uh, a non-political organization that is uh, basically supported mainly by memberships, uh, membership dues, gifts and grants. So if you feel uh, generous, please become members <laughs> and uh, join us here in our endeavors. Uh, among many services that Piazza provides is, uh, you know, mostly serve as a cultural link between the Polish and American communities. We publish, we organize scientific conferences, and uh, the next one is in Krakow this year. So if you by any chance happen to be in Poland in June, um, the conference is between 16th and uh, the 20th, and all the information you can find on the website, on Piazza's website. Uh, and just another sentence, our goals for the next few months really is to expand our lectures and our publishing and we are also digitalizing uh, our books and uh, periodicals and we are trying to make the collection available online uh, very, very soon for everyone to use. And that's basically it and I would like now to give the mic to Norman and uh, oh, go on to the lecture. <laughs> huh? I have are you on the next one? I'm when sorry. When no, I'm not very sorry. I apologize. I know no. it's not delivered. That's okay. No, not at all. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am so glad to see all these friendly and familiar faces, our loyal friends. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce today my husband, today's speaker. Um, Many of you may know that Norman has been participating in various activities of Piazza. He gave a lecture here at the Institute and he gave numerous presentations at Piazza meetings. Norman is a scientist by training and profession. He got his PhD in microbiology at um, MSU microbiology department. And then he joined faculty of New York University School of Medicine in the microbiology department. Subsequently, he joined a New York City-based biotechnology company. And Norman not only has interest in science, but interest in history. He is doing extensive research on family history, beginning with ancestors who left Switzerland in 1743 and settled in Pennsylvania. And he has a very strong interest in uh, suffering movement. And that's the subject of his talk today. So I pass the microphone to Norman Thank you. Uh, several of you have asked, and I, my daughter Christina advised that she was my uh, presentation advice. <laughs> uh, why is a scientist talking about women's suffrage history? Now, there are two reasons. One is, I think as one grows older, one gains an interest in history. At least that's my experience. I'm sure it's true of a lot of other people. Number two, I have a, uh, I have a family connection to a woman who was a suffragette. In fact, I can do this correctly. Uh, I don't have it, but uh, I had a picture of her, I don't have it, but uh, she was very active in the suffrage movement. Uh, she was actually the treasurer of the Suffrage Association for many years. And I started researching a little bit about her and I came across Ernestine Rose. And that's really interesting because she turned out to be Polish. She was not only Polish, but she was a Jewish atheist as well. And she came to the United States. Uh, in 1836, 
spent 33 years here in the suffrage movement. Uh, so I want to tell you her story, and I'm going to try to put it into chapters. And I'm going to, these are the chapters of her life. She spent her early years in Poland until she was 16. When she left the country, she spent 10 years traveling through Europe. And in 1836, she came to the United States, stayed for 33 years, all that time working for women's rights. She spent her last years in Europe, uh, where, she, where she died at the age of 82. Uh, and if we have any time left, I'll talk about the final stages of the women's suffrage movement, the last years before they gained the 19th Amendment, the right to vote. So let's go. Uh, first, the early years in Poland. Uh, Ernestine uh, Suspan Potowska was born in this town of Piotr Trubanowski in 1810. She was born to a family of an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, and she was the only child of the family. Uh, early in her life, she studied uh, Hebrew, and she studied the Torah with a man. She soon became disillusioned with the Jewish religion, and in fact, with all religions. And she was in a class with her father, and they argued a lot uh, in that regard. Uh, but uh, apparently, they had a loving relationship. Uh, when Ernestine was 15 years old, her mother died. And her father, in an attempt to uh, give her a secure future, future, arranged the marriage for her, she's 15 years old, with a much older Orthodox man. And she rebelled, absolutely rebelled. She argued with her father, she argued with the designated husband, and neither one would give in. So, at 15 years old, in the middle of winter, she took it upon herself to go to the secular court. And she went to the secular court in Kalish, which is about 100 kilometers northwest of Piotr uh, Trubinowski. She waited, she had spent a long time there. She pleaded her own case, and she won. The secular case, secular court, awarded the contract, she was free. So she went back home, and when she got there, she found that her father had married a 15-year-old girl, the same age she was. So she hung around for about a year. She didn't want to be a, a, a spark of uh, fighting between her father and her stepmother. And uh, she was very uncomfortable. So she said goodbye. And she left, and she took a journey through Europe. Uh, she went to uh, Berlin, she went directly to Berlin, and uh, she didn't know German, she had no means of supporting herself, but she invented a perfume paper which was used to dispel household odors. The people cooked on open fires, they had horrible smells in the house, and she sold the paper and she also tutored. Uh, she tutored in Hebrew and Polish, and she learned to speak German. She had a big problem because as a Jew, she was not allowed to live in the city of Berlin. And she registered a complaint. This is so the story goes. I, I don't verify it, but this is the story. Uh, she registered a complaint and went to a magistrate and went all the way to the king. Now, we don't know whether she met with the king or a representative, but assuming she met with the king, she explained her situation to him and he said, that's a silly rule. So, but if you want to live in Berlin, why don't you just convert to Christianity? I mean, a lot of other people do. And she said, no. She said, essentially, I didn't leave one religion to go into another. No. But uh, the king relented, gave her permission to live in Berlin. Uh, she stayed there two years, and why she left, nobody knows. But uh, she went to Belgium and Netherlands for on her way to France. We don't know how long she stayed there, and almost nothing is known about it. Her, her, her adventures in Belgium and Netherlands. But she ended up in France, and I don't know how long she stayed there, but it must have been at least a year. And uh, uh, in 1830, when the Polish November Uprising took place in Warsaw, it was an uprising of Polish cadets against the uh, Russian occupiers. Uh, that part of Poland was controlled by Russia at that time. Uh, the, the, the uprising was put down in a few weeks. 
by the superior Russian forces. But uh, in any case, she left for uh, Poland. She got as far as the Rhine, and she was stopped by the Austro-Hungarians of soldiers. And she returned not to France, but to England. And uh, she didn't know a word of English, uh, but she went anyway. She again sold a perfume paper, and she tutored two uh, certain daughters of a noble, uh, an English nobleman. And through that connection, she Norman, yeah. excuse me, there's a technical issue. Uh, I would like you to move a little bit because it's being recorded. It's being recorded, and we want to have you in the picture, and you're a little bit too far, so what I'll do is just move this a little bit. That's good enough. As long as you stay like by the end of the say oh exactly. Then remember to keep the mic to the I'm sorry. I don't know if I want this important. Through the connection of, of uh, Tudor and the daughters of a English nobleman, she met this man, Robert Owen, who was a very wealthy industrialist. He had big textile mills in Scotland. And unlike the other robber barons of that time, he was very good to his employees. He had a very uh, socialist mentality. Uh, he he, he uh, paid them a living wage, he provided medical care and schooling, and uh, and, and, and uh, had homes for them. He uh, and he had a store where he sold his employees' goods without, with, at no profit. Uh, well, he was a founder of a socialist, atheistic, uh, utopian movement called Owenism. And uh, the basic principle of Owenism was that man is what he is because he is formed by the circumstances of his environment. Therefore, he is not responsible for what he is. In other words, if a man is a murderer, it's not his fault. It's, the, it's how he grew up and how he was influenced. The environment formed him. If he was a very wonderful person, likewise, he grew up in an environment which formed him. Totally ignored genetic input, totally ignored differences in personality. But that was the basic belief of his movement. Uh, and it felt that happiness could only be reached by conduct that wants to the happiness of the community. Everybody has to be happy and everybody has to try to make everybody else happy. And one of the parts of that was that you can't have private property. Therefore, he promoted the building of communes and actually built a commune in Indiana. An overnight commune in Indiana, which lasted for three years. And like all the communes of that time, it lasted about three years and they folded. But the tenant that Ernestine latched on to was that women were enslaved in traditional marriages. And she spent the rest of her life uh, fighting for women's rights. During her stay in England, she met and married uh, William Ella Rose, who was not Jewish, uh, but he was an atheist and he was a member of the Owenite movement. And he was a silversmith by trade. And he spent, he was not forward and aggressive as, as she was. He remained in a silversmith shop. And, uh, and using his, the profits from his business, he helped to support her activities and women's rights. This is a, the only piece of jewelry remaining from William Mellor Rose's whole life. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a, I think, a brooch. It, well, uh, Andrew Jackson was the seventh president of the United States. Uh, the cameo was made by somebody else, and William Miller Rose mounted it on this thing. Uh, the, the inscription reads, the union must be sh and shall be preserved. I think he made it between their arrival in 1836, and Jackson was president until March of 1837. So I think he made it in that period. Uh, in 1836, the Roses left England for the United States on a mission to build an Owenite commune somewhere in the U.S. We don't know where. And, and they arrived in the United States on May 4th, 1836. And this now we start the chapter of her life in the United States. This is New York Harbor in 1829. The Roses arrived in 1836, so it's very close. It looks very idyllic. Uh, all the people are nicely dressed, they're standing out on the shore, lovely boats in the water. 
but to a man from New Jersey who visited Manhattan Island in 1836 uh, and wrote about his experience to the uh, Salem, New Jersey Post newspaper. He didn't have a good time. He said, the city of New York is in all probability the most filthy city in the United States. To a person accustomed to the pure atmosphere of the country, the effluvia arising from the carcasses of dead dogs, hogs, and cats with which the streets are ornamented, the effect is sickening. Every few yards, a leakage in the gas pipe emits a stench insufferable. We spent three days in this promising city last week and really blessed our stars when circumstances allowed us to bid adieu to this metropolis of rubbish, stench, and damage. <laughs> so, uh, New York at that time was probably not very clean place. <laughs> this was uh, the United States that the roses arrived in. This is actually 1840. Uh, you can see all of the states were in the eastern part of the country. Uh, Mexico owned uh, this part of the country. This was a disputed territory. The Mexican lands were recovered in the Mexican, in the Mexican uh, War of 1848. Uh, this land here was so uh, was purchased from the Missouri, and that's the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, and there, it, all these territories were practically unexplored. They were very wild. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Alaska was a Russian possession, and Hawaii was a kingdom. Uh, and Andrew Jackson was the president, and he was succeeded by Martin Van Buren in 1837. Well, the rest of the country was probably a lot cleaner than the Manhattan Island, but as far as human rights was concerned, it was absolutely filthy. Uh, more than half the population in the land of the free were not free. There were three million legally enslaved blacks in 10 southern states. And women had few rights and essentially represented a second slave population. Women had severe civil restrictions. They were taxed, but they could not vote. And that was the rallying cry of the Revolutionary War, taxation without representation. Yet, after the war, women were taxed and they could not vote. They did not they did not campaign or hold public office, campaign for or hold public office. And they did not serve on juries, and a woman could not make contracts, keep or control her own wages, transfer property, sell property, or bring any lawsuit. She was legally inert. And she had the restrictions in marriage. If a woman walked into a marriage with a lot of money, the property immediately went under the control of her husband. Uh, and she had no right to control the property, even that which was hers before the marriage. She had no legal rights to require to acquire any property during the marriage. And she had no legal control over her children. If the father wanted to send an 11 year old to work in the coal mines or in a sweatshop, she could do nothing about it. And upon divorce, all rights of property to property and custody of the children went to the husband. And she was out the door with nothing. And there were social restrictions. Women did not speak in public. When a man and a woman spoke on the same platform, the presentation was referred to as promiscuous. <laughs> and women did not attend colleges or universities. There was a few. There were a few exceptions. Lucy Stone, who was a big uh, figure in the women's rights and the women's suffrage movement, uh, was allowed to attend Oberlin College in Ohio. She was very bright, and she graduated in the top five. She was among the top five students in her class. And there was a tradition at Oakland that the top five graduating students would speak at commencement exercises. But because she was a woman, she wasn't allowed to speak. So Oberlin was liberal enough to let her in the school, but they wouldn't let her speak at commencement. Um, the whole situation with regard to women's rights was summed up, that's the thing, by, by this man, Sir William Blackstone, who was a British jurist. By marriage, the husband and a wife are one person in law. That is, the very being of legal existence of a woman is suspended during her marriage, or at least is consolidated, consolidated into that of her husband, under whose wing, protection, and cover she performs everything. In other words, a man had all the rights, and the woman did all the rights. Uh, 
Uh, I don't think anybody ever uh, ever gave a better picture of uh, sexism than this man right here. It sort of summed up the whole thing. This is country and western singer Lyle E. Style and his song, Put Another Log on Fire. I'll play it for you. This is sexism in the song. What year are we talking about? What? What year? Excuse me. Oh, he's modern. I, I see it, but what year more or less? 60s, 70s, 80s? No, it's probably, yeah, probably 80s, 90s, something like that. Anybody here? Okay, this is Lyle Eastyle. Yeah, Lyle Eastyle. Yeah, Lyle Eastyle. Okay, here we go. Lyle Eastyle has put another log on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> put another log on the fire. <laughs> Some bacon and some beans. Go out to the car and change the tire. Wash my socks and soak my old blue jeans. Come on, baby, you can't fill my pipe. And then go fetch my slippers. Pour me up another pot of tea. Put another log on the fire Then come and tell me why you're leaving me Okay, that is sexy oh. insult. Well, Ernestine's, Ernestine's reaction to all that was Agitate, agitate, ought to be the motto of every reformer Agitation is the opposite of stagnation the one is life, the other death. In the years from 1836 to 1850, there's not much known about her activities. But we know almost as soon as she got off the boat, she started a, a petition drive for a New York state law which gave women, married women property rights. And she was initially very unsuccessful, but she persisted she was joined by other women, and finally in 1848, the law was passed. Her first recorded women's rights speech uh, we have is from a newspaper article written about the New England Reform Society's meeting in Boston on May 30th, 1844. The meeting was called to build, uh, uh, to build interest in a overnight-like Commune, which was being built in Scandinavia, New York. Me, and could you please remember it? And, uh, and uh, she met with a very hostile audience. I'm going to read a little bit of it because it gives you an idea of her, uh, her, her ability to stand before a very hostile audience. Uh, she first condemned the church and the clergy as enemies of women's rights. And she painted a picture of the low status of women. And uh, she started, she said in her talk, the clergy and the church don't recognize your rights, my sisters. What rights have women? Are they not the merest slaves on earth? And she said, the, the state of society does not recognize women's equality. The living is in the hands of man. My sisters, speak out for yourselves. Well, the newspaper article continues. The door and the passageway were crammed with spectators, most of them the devotees of the church. And the speaker was assailed with a shower of hisses as fierce as though pandemonium had let loose its metamorphosed angels on a single woman. Mrs. R waited calmly until the tumult had subsided. When she again repeat, repeated the injunction, and again, the tumult rose still higher, and the repetition and the uproar went on until the excited multitude, unable longer to keep up the din, were compelled, through exhaustion, to hear the daring heresy in silence. <laughs> that was in, uh, eight, in 1845, she went on a speaking tour of the western states. She visited the far west of Cincinnati. That was west in those days. Uh, and she contracted malaria. And she uh, got so sick on the return trip that she had to stop in Buffalo, couldn't go any further, and she was taken in by a Quaker family who nursed her back to hell. 
she was okay. But she wasn't faced at all by that experience because the next year she spoke, she went to Michigan where she spoke to the Michigan House of Representatives on the science of government. And she so impressed the legislatures that they asked her to repeat the lecture and two days later she did. She lectured in Lansing where she had been advertised as a gifted and eloquent polonaise whose lectures had been so highly spoken of at the East. The Detroit advertiser urged people to attend her Ann Arbor lecture because those who have heard Mrs. Brothers speak in the highest terms of her as a lecturer and debater. And all who attend will be gratified to ascertain that talent and genius are not confined to the strongest sex. <laughs> and that sort of that sort of tells you the attitude of society. Women were not supposed to be mentally strong enough to withstand the the machinations of society. They were, couldn't understand the pressure of politics or business. Therefore, they had to stay within their proper sphere. Uh, well, Ernestine had been speaking, but she had no, no organization, no movement to speak for. But that began to change in 1848 when these two women, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stamp, both Quakers from Pennsylvania, organized the first in the world women's rights meeting in, in the Seneca Falls, New York. Uh, uh, they, uh, they had met earlier at an anti-slavery meeting in London, England. They met there, they discussed women's rights, and when they returned to the United States, they hardly ever saw each other, they were far apart. But uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was living in Seneca Falls, and Lucretia Mott's sister was living there. So when Lucretia Mott came to visit, they met, they rekindled their women's rights uh, uh, interests, and they organized the first meeting in Seneca Falls. They were very fortunate. This is Seneca Falls. It's between, uh, it's between Cayuga Lake here and Seneca Lake, Seneca Lake here. And at the northern end of the Mid Lake region. Uh, they were very fortunate because they got two of the major figures in the abolitionists, the anti slavery movement. Uh, Frederick Douglass uh, was a freed slave, a social reformer, abolitionist, orator, and statesman. He was living in Rochester and he published an anti slavery newspaper there. Also present, was William Lloyd Garrison, who was the leading figure in the anti-slavery movement. And he published a magazine called The Applicant, uh, an abolitionist newspaper. Uh, the women met, there were 300 people at the meeting. Uh, it was all women on the first day, men and women on the second day. They discussed uh, women's rights and prepared resolutions. And they produced this sort of uh, guide, or, or uh, this document, which uh, contained a modified version of the Declaration of Independence and, and the resolutions that they came, came up with. The Declara they, they, what they did was they took the uh, Declaration of Independence and everywhere the word man appeared, they had and woman, and everywhere the word men appeared, they had and women. For example, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal. And this resolution here, was said resolved that it was the duty of women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elected franchise. This was a hot potato issue, a very controversial issue. And it, it, it was a big fight over it, but it finally got included. And when the, member, the people attending the conference signed off on the document, only 100 of the 300 people signed off on it because it was such a controversial issue. Well, the press and the clergy greeted the meeting with revolution, reign of petticoats, insurrection. The Albany Advocate said the order of things established the creation of mankind and continued 6,000 years would be completely broken. That was a big argument against women's rights. If somehow if she got out of the kitchen and got out of the nursery, it would, so, it would turn society upside down because the whole structure would be broken. And the clergy blasphemy. <laughs> a local paper, the Oneida Whig, Whig, 
said the most shocking and unnatural event ever recorded in the history of the man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ernestine's activities from 1850 to 1861, the start of the Civil War, uh, she played a major role in the uh, women's movement. Uh, she was a leadership role in the annual uh, National Women's Rights Convention, which began in 1850. She had a nearly full schedule of travel and speech training. She was sometimes away from home for like six months. She traveled by foot, by stagecoach, by horse. Railroads were not very plentiful at that time. She lobbied lawmakers. She was in constant battle with legislatures, newspaper editors, ministers, and anyone else opposed to women's rights. Uh, the first National Women's Conference, Women's Suffrage Conference, held in Worcester, Massachusetts in October of 1850. And Ernestine chaired the business a committee and she gave a speech. The business committee screened all of the resolutions before they went on the floor. It's a very important. Okay. Uh, the New York Tribune reported that Ms. Ernest, Mrs. Ernestine Rhodes spoke with great eloquence on the subject of her resolution. Her French accent and extemporaneous <laughs> manner added quite a charm to her animated and forcible style. Well, she had an accent, but it wasn't French. <laughs> probably probably <laughs> influenced by Hebrew and Polish, but not, not by French. Uh, well, this was the reaction of the first woman to ask the right meeting. Right me. Uh, awful combination of socialism, abolitionism, and infidelity. <laughs> the pantalets striking for the pantaloons, whatever that means. <laughs> Bible and Constitution repudiated, the monthly mingling of evolution of socialists and infidels of all sections and color. That's absolute venom. I mean, they are anti, anti pro slavery, anti black, and anti woman. You can see what the women were up against. Uh, at her, the next meeting, she made one of her most famous speech, her uh, unsurpassed speech. Paul A. Wright Davis, who was the chairman of the convention, uh, 19 years later, uh, said that Mrs. Ernestine Rose made an address of an hour, in an hour in length, which has never been surpassed. She printed it at her own expense and distributed it extensively. What she did was she took the arguments against women dictating having their rights and, uh, and with uh, Force, clarity, and insightful logic and inspired oratory. She delivered with mockery and indignation. Uh, she proceeded to attack those arguments. I'll give you one example of, uh, of, uh, of the argument that she attacked. Uh, one was that the man has a benevolent, benevolently cares for his wife, or has benevolent control over his wife. Her response was, I wish I had the power to make everyone before me fully realize the degradation contained in that idea. Yes, he keeps her, and so he does a favor, of course. By law, they are both considered his property. But she closed her speech with some very hopeful words. She said, the time our trust will come, most slowly yet surely, when one will occupy that high and lofty position for which nature has so eminently fitted her in the destinies of humanity. The, her speech at the third meeting was very interesting because when she talked, she never mentioned her Jewish background or her Polish background. She never talked about herself. But at that meeting, she was introduced as a Polish lady of the Jewish faith. And she responded when she got up to talk. She said, I hope you will have some charity on the kind of speaking in a foreign language. She, English was no problem for her. Yes, in an example of the universality of our claims, for not American women only, but a daughter of poor crushed Poland and the downtrodden and persecuted people called the Jews. A child of Israel pleads for the equal rights of her sex. And then she went on talking about women's rights. Uh, this was a very interesting meeting. This was an annual meeting, uh, the Hartford Bible Convention, and it got together non-believers and believers. And they did discuss a topic, and the topic for this convention was, was the Bible an inspiration of God? And of course, the believers, who were called the Bibles, 
for the defenders of divine authorship, but the non-believers were called infidels, and they never were. Well, it was predominantly Bibles, attending the meeting. It was a hall that held 1,600 people, and there were, and there were 160 seminary students from nearby Trinity College Seminary and they the Bibles. And uh, one of the big problems, and, and uh, William Lloyd Garrison spoke against slavery, and uh, Ernestine spoke for women's rights. And one of the big problems with the churches who supported slavery and were against women's rights was they quoted the Bible to support their, their and you could quote passages in the Bible that support slavery and women's rights and, and, and the subjugation of women. Genesis, and that I and that desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And in Corinthians, the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man. And in Peter, likewise ye wives, be in subjection to your husbands. So this is what they wrote here. When, when William Lloyd Garrison spoke, he was booed and hissed, and, uh, and he had a hard time. He was very disappointed. He, he was a very religious man. Uh, and when Ernestine got up to speak, uh, she uh, she was likewise hooted and jeered at. And at one point in her talk, when she was expressing disapproval of uh, uh, indoctrinating children into religion, somebody got to the gas meter and turned off the gas. And the lights went out, and there was hooting and yelling and screaming and all kinds of noise, pandemonium for 20 minutes. And when somebody got back to the, turn the gas on and the lights came on, she resumed. And she, the first thing she said was, when the lights were extinguished, it reminded me of one of the true things we find in the Bible, that some there are who love darkness better than light. <laughs> <laughs> but then she came right back at the top and she said, to my sisters, I would but say that the defenders of the Bible have given you a most practical evidence of the rights and liberties Christianity has conferred upon them. The Bible has enslaved you. The churches have been built upon your subjugated nets. Do you wish to be free? Then you must trample the Bible, the church, and the priests under your feet. And the place went crazy. It went really loud. Uh, but she gave another talk the next night under much quieter conditions. So she repeated a lot of what she tried to say here because she felt that she had it down the cross. Uh, at the uh, 1953 National Women's Convention, she spoke of the double standard of sexual morality, and the Cleveland Plain Dealer said she was the master spirit of the convention. Uh, uh, she addressed in uh, March she, of 84, she addressed committees of the New York State Legislature on behalf of Rowan Price, and she was viciously attacked in the Albany Register. It is a melancholy reflection that should be found any who are willing to follow the lead of the ringleted love-handed, exotic, and a senior woman. By 1856, she was exhausted and tired, and she was sick. And um, she and William decided to go to Europe and spend six months. Uh, and that they did. Uh, uh, they, they took a, a sailing vessel, it took them five weeks to get from New York to Liverpool, and she was seasick every day. Uh, but when they got to Europe, uh, where they spent six months, she, uh, they, they traveled around, they visited. They visited London, Paris, Lyon, <coughs> Chambéry, Dawson, Strasbourg, Baden-Baden, Heidelberg, Frankfurt, Koblenz, Cologne, Berlin, Dresden, Prague, Vienna, Trieste, Venice, Milan, Turin, Genoa, Leghorn, Florence, Rome, and Naples. No crack on No crack on them. No crack But uh, when she got, they got to England, she met up with Robert Owen and some other her old friends from England. And then they went on to France, where she met this woman, uh, Jenny Daricourt, uh, who was a physician midwife, and she was also a feminist, a free thinker, and a writer. And she interviewed Ernestine for a few days, and she wrote a biography. It was the first biography it was really a seven-page puff piece, but it's interesting because it, she talked about her early life, and without that, nobody would really know much about it. Uh, 
one interesting thing was she wrote home, she wrote back to America her impressions of her trip, and she had an impression, and she was uh, appalled by the British, and she adored the French. Uh, she wrote back home about the, uh, about the British. I have to see. That's for the British, she said. The buildings are massive, the animals strong, the people are heavy and dull. And as, long, and as long as they have enough beer to drink, they are quite content to be taxed heavily to support a most extravagant aristocracy who despise them for it. As for the French, she just glowed. Even the most ignorant, he can't write his name, visits and examines the various museums and inquires of the nature and meaning of things. He looks in rapture at a beautiful sculpture or painting of a philosopher or figure and listens del with delight to the elevating strains of a Mozart or Beethoven in taste, natural grace, and a certain refinement of all the Frenchmen. Well, they returned home on this boat, the Europa steamboat, uh, whereas it took them five weeks on the sailing boat to get to England, they got home in 13 days on the steamboat. And for the whole trip, she didn't give a single talk, which is quite uncharacteristic her. But on the last day of the voyage, she talked to the, uh, the, the passengers and crew on the rights of man as the basis of the rights of women. Following her return from Europe, she resumed a busy schedule, manic schedule, travel, speech making, lobbying, and debating until the start of the Civil War. Two days before the start of the Civil War, April 10th, uh, 1861, she gave her second most famous speech, a defense of atheism. And even, I think even a committed believer should read the speech because in, she, she shows a, an incredible knowledge of the Bible, an incredible knowledge of the science of that time. And you can see her thinking and her logic and her presentation. It's absolutely spectacular. What she says for atheism, in proportion to man's ignorance does he believe in the mysterious, being unacquainted with the nature of laws of things around him, with the true causes of the, to the effects he witnessed, he ascribed them to false ones, to supernatural agencies. Before electricity was discovered, a thunderstorm was said to come from the wrath of an offended deity. <laughs> to this fiction of man's uncultivated mind has been attributed all of good and of evil, of wisdom and of folly. Man has talked about him, written about him, disputed about him, fought about him, sacrificed himself, and extirpated his fellow man. Rivers of blood and oceans of tears have been shed to please him. Yet no one has ever been able to demonstrate his existence. That is uh, Ernestine Rose on uh, atheism. Uh, well, the Civil War began on March, on April uh, 12, 1861 with the shelling of Fort Sumter by the Confederate forces. And at that point, the women's rights activities came to a stop. The women instead uh, dedicated themselves to supporting the uh, Union in the war. Uh, and after the war, they formed a, a, uh, the American Equal Rights Association with the goal of gaining rights, especially suffrage, irrespective of race, color, or sex. They were, they were put, they're using this organ to push to get the right to vote. A little history. Uh, the in, in, during the war, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. It freed all slaves, except those who were in the Confederate States. The Confederacy was still alive at that time. And as the Union Army took over various southern states, the slaves became free. It was, a, the, the abolition of slavery was attached to the Constitution through the 13th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment, they, they were free, but they had no rights. The 14th Amendment gave free slaves their rights. The right to a trial by jury, equal protection under the law, the right to uh, initiate a lawsuit, and so on. But the big crunch came in the 15th Amendment, and the women were trying to get on it. The 15th Amendment was, was, would give voting rights to black males, not to black females, just black males. And uh, the women got into a big row 
with the abolitionists because the abolitionists were worried that if women were on the movement, it would, it would weight it down and it wouldn't get passed. And the women lost out. The amendment passed getting voting rights cannot be denied on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of safety, not sex. Sex was not included. And it split the women's movement in half. There were women who were sympathetic with, with this situation of not getting the, the vote on the uh, I lost my point. But uh, anyhow. Oh well. Uh, and, and the other group wanted to work for getting women on the 15th Amendment. But, uh, and they also had different philosophies. For example, uh, one group formed the one that wanted to get on the ballot on the amendment, which included Rose, Stanton, and Anthony, uh, formed the National. Women's Suffrage Association. And the other group was more, uh, more lenient towards the 15th Amendment, uh, formed the American Women's Suffrage Movement. The, this, the group on top of the national was before a direct attack on Congress and the President. The American group wanted to go state by state and get each state to be one of the rights. Okay. Well, by that time, Ernestine and her husband, William, had decided they'd had enough of America, and they left for good for Europe. Uh, they left on June 18, 1869. They arrived in Europe. They traveled all over where she visited various spas. And, but she still continued to speak, but not as frequently in the United States. a much more relaxed schedule. Uh, they returned to the US in 1874 for a six month stay and she appeared at the last at the National Women's Rights Convention of that year. In November of 1874 she gave her last talk in a, a, a last talk in a public forum. She addressed the Internet an International Peace Conference in Paris and gave a 15 minute address in French. On uh, January 25th of 1882, William L. Rose suffered a heart attack and died. Ernestine died uh, 10 years later, and they were both buried in Highgate Cemetery in London. Meanwhile, the fight for women's rights went on. Uh, the, the two divided groups finally reformed in 1890 under the chairmanship of Terry Chapman Catt, but they were still making absolutely no progress. And they made no progress until they made the final push with this woman, Alice Paul. Did anybody see the movie uh, Iron Jawed Angels? It's a wonderful depiction of the last years of women gaining the rights. It's a 2004 movie. It's on YouTube. You can look it up. Uh, she was unhappy with the with the Women's Association and she split it up, split off from that and formed the National Women's Party in 1916. Uh, and they, she formed the National Women's Party and she devised a strategy directly attacking this man, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was the, the 28th president of the United States. He was born in 1856 in slaveholding Virginia. So he grew, he grew up in the South among slaves, slave, a slave uh, situation. Uh, he became president of Princeton from 1902 to 1910. He was governor of New Jersey for two years and became president in 1913. And he was a racist. He did not allow blacks to enter Princeton while he was president. And when he became president, he did not allow blacks to enter the civil service. And it was one of their main routes to the middle class. So he was clearly a racist. Now, I don't know what, exactly what his, right, his attitude was towards women and women's rights, but he absolutely had no interest in women's rights, none at all. I don't know whether he was anti-women's rights, but he certainly had no interest. Well, uh, on 
March 3rd, 1913, the day before he was inaugurated, he stopped at Princeton, said a hail goodbye to all his dear colleagues, got on the train, went from Washington, got off the train, the train station, and there was nobody there. Nobody to meet the, the new reelected president. <laughs> Where they were, they were all on um, Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue at a woman's a woman's uh, suffrage parade organized by Alice Paul. This is Inez Mulhallens who led the parade. And uh, they dressed her up in a white gown and a tiara and she was riding a horse to make a parade. Eight thousand women marching down Pennsylvania Avenue. That's part of the parade. And that's the crowd watching. Wow. Now, at some point during the parade, men who were up lining the sidewalks began to attack the women. They tore down their banners, they beat up on the women. And the Washington police just sat there and did nothing. They did nothing to stop the crowd. Well, they had to call in the military from the nearby army base, and they, they quelled the situation. But uh, there was a congressional investigation, and the Washington, D.C. chief of police was forced to resign. Uh, now, Alice Paul started a direct protest against Wilson. And in December of 1960, she placed pickets around the White House carrying the suffrage banners. It was the first time that anybody had ever made a political demonstration in front of the White House. And the women uh, picketed from December of 1916 through June of 1917. But on June 20th of 1917, a Russian delegation came to visit Wilson at the White House. And the women, dis women displayed banners which said, tell our government that it must liberate its women before it can claim Russia as an ally. And that was a bit too much for Wilson, because the next day, the, picket, the women picking the White right House were arrested, convicted, and sent to a workhouse, the Oak Oram Workhouse in Virginia. And it was an awful place. It was full of rats and mice, and it was cold, damp, dark, uh, and the, the bedding was inadequate, it was just awful. Uh, and they were held there for several weeks. But uh, until one of Wilson's former supporters, a man who had supported him during the election and gotten a patronage job as head of the uh, customs house in New York, was kind of was appalled at the condition. He made an appointment to visit Wilson in the White House, and he said, look, I'm going to resign unless you do something about these women. And Wilson claimed no knowledge of the fact that they were being mistreated in prison. Uh, but uh, Wilson begged him not to do anything, don't quit it till now. But the next day, Wilson released all the women. And Alice Paul was asked uh, for, if the picketing would continue. And she said, picketing has accomplished it's exactly what we wanted to accomplish, and picketing is going to enforce the issue. And they kept picketing, and they kept getting arrested. And uh, finally, in August, in autumn of 1917, Alice Paul was arrested for, for, for demonstrating. She was sentenced to seven months in the prison. She was put in a psychiatric ward in isolation, and she went on a hunger strike, as all the other women did. And uh, that put a shock into the Wilson administration, because if some, one of them died in prison, it would be a horrible thing for the Wilson administration. So, uh, I'll show you a few pictures. There's yeah. women being arrested. Uh, that's uh, women being taken to the uh, workhouse. And this is, they were forced fed. They took a, a tube, set it right down their esophagus, and poured raw eggs and milk mixture right into their stomach. Most of them vomited back up and they were damaged and so on. If the woman closed her mouth and wouldn't open it, they would go up her nostril. Absolutely awful. Uh, well, in the beginning, in the autumn of uh, 1917, the women started publicizing the treatment that the women were getting, and they were being convicted for expressing their First Amendment rights. Terrible situation. And uh, 
they have organized a prison special. It's a group of women dressed up like prisoners who went around the country to dramatize and publicize the situation. And the White House got several hundred thousand letters from all over the country. And uh, they were embarrassed. So uh, after Alice Paul, and finally in November of 1917, Alice Paul's sentence was commuted. And when she was asked if the picketing would continue, she replied, the attempt to suppress legitimate propaganda has failed. But what we do depends entirely on what the administration does. Well, Wilson was now boxed into a political corner. He had no choice. And on January 18, 1918, he announced his support for the suffrage amendment. And the next day, the House of Representatives approved the amendment. They had a two-thirds vote to approve. In Jan of 19, in 1919, the Senate approved. So the amendment passed both houses of Congress. The next step to get an amendment in the Constitution is to have three-fourths of the states approve or ratify the amendment. Well, the women got, the women got, uh, let's see where I am here. The women got, this is the signing of the document after approval by both houses of Congress. And my, my, my family connection woman, Harriet Taylor Upton, is standing right there. And uh, well, I went to, the, went to the states. There were 48 states at that time. Alaska and Hawaii had not been, become states yet. So three fourths of the states were required for approval of the amendment. They had 35 states, and they went to Tennessee conservative state. Uh, they won, the legislature passed the amendment by one vote. And they got the amendment passed. Uh, and the amendment stated, it was written by Susan B. Anthony, it was first submitted to Congress in 1878. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And the ratified amendment was signed on August 26, 1920, by Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby. Colby, there were no cameras, no reporters, and no women present. He signed it in his residence. You wonder why the Secretary of State, not the President, signed it. Wilson had a big stroke in the last year of his presidency, and he was totally inactive. Well, the sad thing was that all the women who had started the women's rights movement, uh, Susan B. Anthony, Lucy, Lucy Stone, uh, Reverend Antoinette Brown, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanley, Lucretia Mott, were all dead by the time the amendment was passed. They did not live to see the realization. And Ernestine Rose is hardly remembered today. Although I think she's a fabulous individual, she's hardly remembered at all. But uh, she wrote in a letter to Susan B. Anthony, all that I can tell you is that I use my humble powers to the uttermost and raise my voice in behalf of women's rights in general and the elevation of women in particular nearly all my life. Her friend William Lloyd Garrison said of her, she's one of the most remarkable women, women of the age. As the advocate of the rights of her sex, she has no security. And her friends at the Boston Investigator, a, uh, a free-thinking newspaper in Boston, wrote that she labored for the human race with noble purpose and unselfish shame. Such a life as she lived is to be imitated by those who would add to the glory of humanity. Well, that's the story of Ernestine Wells. Thank you very much.